Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the 10-minute chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now, you can see here, I just wanted to point out that the behavior of a normal market, if you've read through Jesse Livermore's Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, um, he was the first one to identify support and resistance concepts and how they work. And the stair-stepping behavior that you see here in the market here, this is actually a normal market uh, behavior. In other words, this is what happens when um, the resistance is overcome. You can see it breaks out to the high. New highs, um, same thing here. Uh, often there's a retest. Uh, we're seeing a retest right now. We actually ran to 1770. And you have to keep in mind that at any moment, the people that manipulate these markets, um, it's like a ball, you know, underwater. It's it, it's gonna it's gonna come up to the top and pop up, but there's a lot of forces that they use to keep it down. It's manipulated, and so you know this might be the beginning of a massive smackdown right here. We just don't know. Uh, that's how they do things. Or it might just be a pullback and a run into new highs. Now, we're going to talk about this alleged, and I'm definitely siding with the alleged term, silver position being accumulated by J.P. Morgan. Um, I personally don't believe this is that big of a story. And I think it initially came from Ted Butler, but we're going to look at Wealth Watchman talking about it as well. But before we do that, I want to show you something on the blog here, just to give you a idea of what it's like, what uh, Jennifer and I do uh, on a daily basis. You know, we started the blog in 2011 or the YouTube back in 2007. So we've been doing this for a long time. Um, we've had revenues come and go. Um, the, there's a constant struggle trying to keep things solvent, we'll say. Um, and that has to do with really it not it doesn't have to do with the popularity of the site the site's very popular it, ha it has to do with a lot of machinations that we're constantly dealing with and i'm just going to give you an example here so you can see the type of thing that we have to deal with now you remember the last video i did on the flat earth thing um am i more than 80 20 i don't know maybe i'm 70 30 i still there's a lot of answers i don't have and uh, i appreciate all the members coming out um, and giving their doubts. Uh, I, I didn't think it would be received the way it was received. It was actually received very well, which means that people are thinking about things. And that's the only thing I can ask is that people really question things. I don't know the answer. I honestly don't know the answer. Um, I'm pretty sure the Bible leans towards the, the flat side, but um, it doesn't seem to be definitive one way or the other. But again, I need to do a thorough study with that view in mind because it may be very possible that I skipped over a lot of things. So again, thanks to everybody who contributed to the discussion. This is this is what we live for. This is what's really important. We all really want to search out and find the truth. So what I did today on the subject was I went ahead and did a tinfoil hat Sunday. And you can see that I uh, put on the um, Flat Earth Clues uh, movie. And then I did the, the interview with Eric DeBay. And then I did a different one with this Matt this is kind of like his story, his whistleblower story, because you need to understand where he's coming from. He was an artist hired because he had the ability to make things indistinguishable from reality. He literally could paint a picture that's as accurate as the photograph. That's why NASA was interested in him, and that's why he became a NASA whistleblower. So go ahead and watch that interview. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because of this story here. So I broke this story. Um, it's not like I, you know, did something totally unique or uh, extra special. I just kind of summarized some information that was out there, put it in a package. Um, that's what a lot of people do. That's pretty much what a lot of these sites are, Drudge Report, Before It's News. But what I wanted to show you here real quick is the type of thing that we have to battle constantly, trying to run a blog and a YouTube channel and a member site and diversify and do things because we have to be uh, immune to the the money. In other words, we cannot be dependent upon any one source of money. 
because if we do, then they have the ability to leverage and tell us what to say. I can give you an example. Uh, many of you might be familiar with uh, John Todd, who uh, you'll have to YouTube it. I don't have time to go into it, but John Todd came out in the 1970s. He was a person who uh, allegedly he claimed that he w he came out of Satanism, and he became a, a Christian, a born again Christian, and he went around the country touring and, and telling you know everything that he knew. Uh, a lot of the things didn't pan out. A lot of the stuff is still accurate to this day. But one of the things that he said was that they had methods of controlling churches. And one of the ways they controlled churches was that they would come in. You have to remember these people, whether you think they're Satanists or Freemasons or Jesuits or whatever you think they are. A lot of people think they're Jews. I totally disagree with that for many reasons. But whatever, you, whoever you think they are, they have an unlimited amount of money. And what they can do with that money is they can make you dependent until they pull the plug. Now, what John Todd talked about was how they would come into churches and have and join the church and bring in a certain number of members that appeared to be, by all indications, honest Christians. But those people would start to give at the collection plate. And they give in a, a increasingly larger fashion over a period of time. What this, hap what this enabled to happen was that the church could grow, whether it means adding more buildings or adding more parking or adding, you know, just growing, getting more people, but also becoming more dependent upon the money that's coming in. And then what would happen, what they would do is once those specific donors were pretty much supporting the church, they would confront the pastor and tell him, you're going to begin to give this message or that message. You're going to stop saying this or you're going to start saying that. And if you don't say what we tell you to say, we're going to pull the plug. And you won't be able to say anything. So you're going to do what we tell you to do. So that's the kind of subtle trap there is. Now, the reason why I bring this up, I want to show you. We run this as a business, but I want to show you what we're up against here. So here's the story. This tinfoil hat Sunday, that's a term that I coined and we've been doing it on Sundays a lot of stuff let's go ahead and copy this and do a search for it and you'll see here this is a Google search now you'll notice that the first hit that comes up is before its news this is actually before its news taking the story that I did this is actually silver is the new going into before its news and posting the story you can see first appeared on silver for the people so there is a credit given there but the first hit is before its news now the second hit is godlike productions now i went to godlike productions as soon as i pinned the story on the blog and i went ahead and and did a link back to it here's the link to godlike productions the second link on google sorry that message is no longer in the database. So the story that I created was censored from Godlike Productions within minutes of my posting it. Now, here's another fascinating thing. If we do a find for Brother John F., we're on the front page of Google. You can see we're not found on the front page of Google. Even though this is our story, let's go to the next page. We're not found on the second page of Google for our own story. Third page. We're not found on the third page of Google, and that's it. So every single result on Google, 300 results on Google, does not find the or original poster of the original story. Now you tell me how that's possible. Let's take the same thing. Let's head over to Bing. This is another, this is the Microsoft Yahoo search network. It's a quote unquote competitor to Google. Uh, we also run some ads from them. And keep in mind that our ad revenues are based upon how far we show up in the search engine. We didn't show up at all. So let's look at Bing. They run media.net ad network, and let's look up our title again here. So you can see the first hit is before its news. The second hit is silver is the new. And, and then here's our godlike productions, 
message deleted from the database. And let's look for Brother John F. Okay, so you can see here that down one, two, three, four, fifth place is actual listing for the original post from our blog. So now that would make one wonder why, since Bing has it fifth, Google doesn't have it anywhere. Are you starting to see what I'm talking about, about the people that we're up against, how powerful they are, what all they control? This is why we have to be diversified. And that's one of the reasons why we appreciate so much your support for what we do. Now I could go over to DuckDuckGo and I could go to all, over all these other sites, but it's the same pattern everywhere. We are always fighting an uphill battle because the people or the beings will say that we're fighting against they're liars, they're thieves, they're cheats, they're murderers, they're everything evil. And the truth, which is what we, this is the only thing we're interested in, is truth. Whatever that, wherever that leads, whatever that is. Uh, we know the Bible, the King James Bible, is the absolute truth. And, but we're also trusting Jesus to reveal the rest of the truth to us. And we're going to bring it to everybody that we possibly can. But you can see we're, we are against some very powerful forces and uh, so that's something to think about. This guy here, Matt, um, if you go through all his videos, you'll see they tried to kill him in a car accident. And uh, so there's, this is some serious stuff going on. Now let me get over to the main topic of the night, and that's going to be this J.P. Morgan story. Uh, we're going to start off with the Ted Butler story. And I'll just say to you members, just between you and me, I have some serious doubts about Ted Butler. I, I don't really know, but it seems to me that whenever Ted Butler comes out with something big that's going to happen, you remember the CFTC hearings? Uh, I always said it will come to nothing and that Bart Chilton is inside, paid off. It's a done deal. Even to this day, I was listening to Andrew McGuire and he's still singing the praises of Bart Chilton. Uh, I never bought into it. So I definitely uh, take everything that Ted Butler says with a grain of salt. And I think I have good reason for saying that. Anyway, this is this breaking story about J.P. Morgan supposedly piling up this gigantic 350 million ounce physical war chest. And we'll read it. As I've mentioned previously, J.P. Morgan is still stopping taking silver deliveries on its own house account. Uh, in the May COMEX futures contract, they've taken over 3 million ounces so far. It still looks like J.P. Morgan will take another million ounces or so before the delivery period is over. This is in addition to the 7.5 million ounces the bank took in the March delivery period. Another standout development in recent weeks has been the withdrawal of 5 million ounces from the big silver ETF SLV. This large withdrawal would appear to be a big buyer converting shares into metal for the purpose of acquiring physical silver and avoiding the 5% ownership reporting requirement. I believe this is the work of JP Morgan and rep represents the mechanism by which the bank has amassed a bulk of 350 million ounces I claim it has acquired over the past four years. And he goes on. So, Let's uh, get down to the summary because I don't have time to read that all. But it it is interesting when he goes into the Bear Stern. So we'll read that part. At the end of 2007, when the price of silver was less than $15, but close to the highest price it had been in 25 years, Bear Stearns assumed the role of the biggest silver and gold short when these positions were transferred from AIG. From the end of 2007 to March 2008, the price of silver rose to $21 and gold rose from $800 to $1,000. Based upon the size of the short positions that Bear Stearns held, the investment bank had to come up with more than $2 billion in margin money. Bear was unable to do so, and so the U.S. government arranged for J.P. Morgan to take over Bear Stearns and its massive COMEX short positions in silver and gold. With the cooperation from the federal government, J.P. Morgan was able to turn silver and gold prices sharply lower into the year end 2008 and made well over $1 billion as a result of falling metals prices. Thus, they were able to greatly reduce the short positions inherited from Bear Stearns. J.P. Morgan then repeated the process of selling short great additional quantities of COMEX short contracts on metal price rallies. 
buying back those short positions when prices fell. J.P. Morgan's profits from their short side of the comic silver and gold amounted to hundreds of millions and even billions. So I'm not going to read any more of this except the conclusion here. I'm using the number of 350 million ounces as what J.P. Morgan has acquired, but the real amount may be in excess of 500 million ounces. I'm being somewhat conservative in saying that 350 million ounces because I'm worried that those who deny that J.P. Morgan has acquired any physical silver heads might ex heads might explode if the number is closer to half a billion ounces. I'm not looking for anyone to lose their minds. Understand what these facts mean. Now, there's two interpretations that are given to this, if this is true, which I have serious doubts as to whether it's true or not. But let's say that J.P. Morgan has acquired 350 to 500 million physical ounces of silver. What do they intend to do with it? Uh, well, one of the one of the scares is they intend to dump it and crush the price. Well, haven't they been able to crush prices without having physical silver? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's go over to the Wealth Watchman article. And this is about the same thing. He reported this quite a while back, but he has a little bit of a disagreement with Ted Butler. So let's read here. All in all, J.P. Morgan has added over 8.3 million ounces of additional silver in just the past two weeks alone. Ted Butler has said that he believes most of the silver is owed to J.P. Morgan after they stood for delivery last month. This is no isolated incident either, but part of an ongoing trend by this bank to acquire the single largest silver stockpile within the banking world. In fact, Mr. Butler also believes that J.P. Morgan has spent the last four years acquiring one of the largest hordes of silver in modern times. He believes this so strongly that he has put the possible current number of ounces in J.P. Morgan's coffers at several hundred million. Now, we can't know for sure if J.P. Morgan is the largest silver short in the SLV or whether they're or whether or not they're the Mr. Big, as he calls them, buying up many government silver coins. But if they are indeed active within the SLV shenanigans, and if their accumulation there matches the same trend line in their COMEX vaults, then he could well be right that they currently have the largest commercial stockpile of silver on Earth. Why, though? Why, ever, after extricating itself from much of its silver shorts, is J.P. Morgan Chase still bothering with buying tens or hundreds of millions of ounces of silver? Why, after nearly 18 months of calm, would J.P. Morgan suddenly rush to take delivery of the maximum allowable silver ounces in a delivery month? Think about it. If silver is so plentiful and available in quantities that would allow the comics to give every investor a good delivery bar for a personal doorstop with silver to spare, then why would J.P. Morgan bother with such an accumulation in the first place? Why bother creating such a vast stockpile if silver is so oversupplied? This is the question that no critic can answer. If silver was destined to go back to years of further losses, then why would the world's biggest insider continue to acquire a sure, sure loser at such high prices? They wouldn't. A reminder, Ted Butler, a man whom I greatly respect, has said that he believes J.P. Morgan has acquired silver all this time for the mother load. The ultimate payout is he believes they know that silver's price explosion is an eventual inevitability. That part I agree with them on. However, I disagree that J.P. Morgan's endgame, as well as the Fed and the U.S. Treasuries all along, was to simply score big on a silver explosion. I mean, these guys in D.C. issue trillions of dollars of bonds per year. J.P. Morgan in their secret money room moves around trillions of dollars per day. Per day. Do you really think that they care whether or not they make 10, 20, or 50 billion dollars on a silver trade? Is that really why J.P. Morgan had to take on Bear Stearns' short position in a shotgun wedding arranged by the Fed and the Treasury? Not hardly, brothers. Remember, silver is the banking dragon's vulnerable spot. It is the pressure point knockout. And thusly, it has been my belief that J.P. Morgan and the banking cartel doesn't rig silver and gold to make dollars. Rather, they rig silver and gold to make dollars possible. And I'm going to side with Wealth Watchman here. I think he's right. So let me give you some evidence of this. This is J.P. Morgan's key statistics from Yahoo. So you can see that J.P. Morgan is a company with a market cap of $245 billion. A negative $213 billion enterprise value? That's kind of strange. You can see they also have revenues of $92 billion. I believe that's per quarter. They also have total cash of $1.15 trillion. And they have total debt of $692 billion. This is not their derivatives book. 
None of this is their derivatives book. This is just the company. So you have a $250 billion company with a trillion dollars in cash and $700 billion in debt. Um, what's the reality behind these figures? I don't know. But let's do some simple math here. Let's think about the silver price. Okay, they're telling us that JP Morgan, well, I don't have my calculator up here, so uh, I'll, we'll go ahead and do it mentally. They're telling us that JP Morgan has amassed 350 million ounces of silver. Let's say that JP Morgan makes $10 per ounce on that. How much is that? That's 3.5 billion. That's peanuts. That's a rounding error. That's nothing. Let's say that JP Morgan makes $100 per ounce on that. How much is that? 35 billion? Again, that's still a rounding error. They take in 92 billion a quarter. Let's say that JP Morgan makes $1,000 per ounce. That's $350 billion. That's starting to make a difference. But does that impact their derivatives book, which is up in the trillions, tens, twenties, trillions? So if JP Morgan is taking a physical long position and the paper positions are going to wash out and the physical is going to be the only thing left standing, then for them to have an impact on how much they have an enterprise market cap and revenues and debt and cash, silver is going to have to gain more than a thousand dollars an ounce for that $350 million to make any difference in JP Morgan's position. Doesn't really matter to me who's right on that um, because it's going to take a big, big move to make any difference. So back to the silver price, you can see here that uh, we're getting kind of a smackdown. That's to be expected. Uh, these things stair step up in kind of a normal way until they don't, until they're absolutely crushed. Normally that's on very, very high volume in the after hours. That's not what we're seeing. My guess is that this is a pullback uh, test of the breakout. We'll probably run higher. Don't know where that's going to be. Maybe we'll run to 20. We could easily run to 25. Uh, we could run to 30. And that really wouldn't be unprecedented. The volume is absolutely astronomical. You can see that. It's crazy volume that this bottom is in. And you can see it appears that that volume is bottoming volume. So a run to any price would not surprise me. And we'll talk to you next time.